I can remember from a very early age being absolutely fascinated by the story of Moses and the burning bush. The image of a bush engulfed by flame yet not consumed by flame fired my young imagination as did the notion of receiving so clear and so personal a communication from God. Was it beautiful? Was it terrifying? What did God sound like? In my imagination, God sounded not like a single voice, but more like a perfect chorus of many simultaneous voices, male and female, young and ancient, speaking from the burning bush. Most of all, what was it like for God suddenly to come calling as if from out of nowhere? Moses is just minding his own business and his father-in-law's sheep, and God shows up in a burning shrubbery and sends him off on a divine errand to save God's people. But then, as I think about it, does this theophany and this call from God really come from out of nowhere? Does it come as something so unpredictable or so unexpected? Or is it more like a culmination of something God has been preparing Moses for through his entire life? If we recall the larger story of Moses, which we find in Exodus chapter 2, he was born in Egypt into a rising era of oppression in which the infant sons of his people were being killed by the order of the Pharaoh, the Egyptian king. Hidden by his mother from those who might harm him, Moses was discovered by the Egyptian Pharaoh's daughter and raised as her own child, effectively making him an Egyptian prince. He grew up, in other words, in intimate proximity to the very court to which he is now about to be sent, a Hebrew child in the palaces of the ruler of Egypt. Additionally, Moses grew up knowing his Hebrew heritage even while looking from the protection and the privilege of the palace windows upon the conditions of his people's suffering, originating from that self-same palace. I can imagine it creating a tug of war in Moses' gut from a very early age. After all, he could either dissociate from his heritage and be indifferent, I'm no Hebrew, I'm a prince of Egypt or he could own his heritage and inwardly ache for his people. Eventually, as a young man, the anger in his gut erupted. One day he saw an Egyptian taskmaster beating one of the Hebrew slaves, and Moses killed the Egyptian and, fearing for his own life, fled the country, went to Midian, married, started a family, and just tended his father-in-law's sheep. It seems unlikely that in fleeing, Moses ever forgot about his kinfolk in Egypt, however. You can run from your circumstances, but it's a lot harder to run from yourself. The Moses who is now living in Midian is the same Moses who struck out in youthful rage at the unjust mistreatment of a Hebrew slave. His long time in Midian almost has the feeling of a period of gestation. So when the call comes, when the Holy of Holies speaks to Moses, I think that it's the fire in the bush calling out to the old fire in his belly, and I think Moses knows it. That's why he tries to debate with God. Oh, send someone else. I'm, I'm not a good speaker. I can't do it. I've got a thing that day. I've done it, and you've likely done it too. Made feeble excuses not to do something difficult or demanding that I know very well is just what I must do. But here's the bottom line. There's no one, no one better positioned than Moses to undertake this particular calling. He's a Hebrew, one who can relate to and lead God's people who need to be led and who need deliverance. 
Yet he also knows the ways of Pharaoh's court, even if it's now a different Pharaoh. And he has lived in the wilderness as a shepherd, so he can now shepherd God's people in the wilderness. It's like a job for which there's one qualified applicant. This encounter with God, this call from the burning bush, does not come from out of nowhere. It's been a lifetime in the making. As in the biblical story of Esther, Moses has been uniquely positioned for such a time as this. Now I think that's an important realization to take away from this story because it allows us to begin to relate to the story in a different way, a way that is perhaps more relevant to our lives. If we keep the story in the realm of the magical or the fantastical, focusing upon the specific way that God reveals God's self to Moses, a burning bush, then it's an old, old story that seemingly has little to do with us. I've never seen a burning bush, nor heard audibly the voice of God. Obviously then, God called Moses, but God has no such similar calling for me. But if we focus instead on what the story reveals about the nature and the activity of God, well then, the story takes on fresh meaning and new challenge for us today. Take for the example the recognition that everything about Moses' life, from his birth to his adoption to the circumstances of his childhood, his personality and passions, his decisions, all of those things equip Moses to fulfill a unique purpose for God in the world, a calling. Might not the same thing be true for each of us? We also are children of God, created as we are, with our own unique personalities and experiences. Is it such a stretch to think that we might each have our own calling? Might it even be an avoidance to claim that we do not? As an illustration of a life's calling, to my knowledge, George Towery never saw a burning bush nor audibly heard God speak. But in his recent funeral, we heard the story of a life spent in education, from a teenage job driving school buses, to his collegiate study of education, to his uniquely caring personality, to his marriage to a social worker. Did George's calling to be a principal of a Title I school come from out of nowhere? Or did it come from out of George's God-given gifts and George's lived experiences? We also have God-given gifts and lived experiences. If we think God only calls or primarily calls from burning bushes, we may miss entirely that God calls to us. To you, yes, to me to accomplish God's purposes in the world. God works in the world in partnership with people. Not just occasional people, not just great people, not just historic people, God's people. And that might lead us to ask with more focus or intent, what is God's calling for me? Or what is God inviting or asking of me at this time, in this moment? Secondly, God honors or values our, call it our availability or our attentiveness or perhaps faithfulness is the best word. When God calls to Moses from the burning bush, Moses responds, here I am. When the boy Samuel hears God's voice in the darkness of the temple, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, he responds, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When the prophet Isaiah hears the call of God in Isaiah chapter 6, he responds, Here am I, send me. When Mary, the mother of Jesus, receives an angelic visitation, she responds, Here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. 
as we seek to hear and to heed God's call, those words may be the most important of all. Here I am, Lord. I'm here. I'm listening. I'm willing. Might we make that faithfully and regularly our prayer? Thirdly, there's a consistent focus or trajectory to God's call. It is not a call to privilege or to power or to success or to greatness as the world sees greatness. It's quite the opposite of that. Theologian Gustavo Gutierrez is famed for his coining of the term God's preferential option for the poor. God's preferential option for the poor. It means that while God loves all of God's children, God looks with special compassion upon the oppressed, the downcast, the hurting, the hopeless, the lost. Hear the words of our scripture lesson. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of their slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. And God heard their groaning, remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God took notice of them. God hears especially the groanings of the oppressed. And God sent to them not a warrior, but a shepherd, a helper, a servant leader to tend God's flock. Or again, look at the work and teachings of Jesus. Look at the people he ministered among. He fed the hungry, tended the sick, welcomed the outcast, gave worth to those whom the religious leaders of the day called sinful or worthless. Jesus in his teaching is more than clear that the needs of the least are our foremost responsibility. It's in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor, the meek, and those who mourn. Blessed are the persecuted and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers. It's in Jesus' insistence that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. It's in his admonition that wherever we do unto the least of our brothers or sisters, the poor, the hungry, the naked, the imprisoned, the sick, and the stranger, we do it as if unto Jesus himself. And that means that often we need no special instruction or particular invitation, no burning bush to know that we're called by God. The call of God is already clear in the outcry of God's people. Do we really need to question our calling to help the victims of Hurricane Harvey in Houston? Immediately and generously and compassionately and sacrificially? I'm humbled and grateful that our session felt immediately the need to respond to this disaster with the words, here we are. Today, as a congregation, we respond with a two-pronged offering which will fund immediate material assistance through Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, which gives all funding to direct aid and reduces no administrative cost. And we'll also provide 100 flood cleanup kits, five-gallon buckets with gloves and sponges and cleansers and clotheslines, detergents, disinfectants, and insect repellent, which will be shipped through Church World Service to aid in cleanup efforts. We'll pack them next Saturday, dedicate them with prayer in our worship service next Sunday, and deliver them to the shipping warehouse on Monday. My thoughts on our scripture passage alongside the events of this week have led me to think deeply and perhaps differently about the call of God. It's not rare, but it is consistent and insistent. It cannot come from out of nowhere because it comes to each of us and from everywhere. 
It may be a mysterious voice in the night or from a burning bush, but it may equally be the voice of the world's need crying out to our ability to help. Hearing it, we hear our life's purpose, and heeding it, we add meaning to our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen.